I always felt that Rapture was an interesting setting and that's why I was drawn to work on the first game. Uh, beyond that though, I felt that the, the sort of broad sweeping story of the founder of the city was uh, the, the first game. And it established the setting, everything was entirely new. Yeah, approaching the opening of Bioshock 2 is a real challenge for a number of ways. I mean, first of all, there's just the standard sequel problem of you're trying to appeal to an audience of people who have played the first game 15 times uh, and people who have never experienced it all before. Um, and then even more so for, for a game like Bioshock, the, the gameplay is so wide and diverse that there are things that some people loved, some people hated, some people want to see completely changed, some people want to see exactly the same. Um, and so uh, it, it took a lot of revision and a lot of iteration. And from there to introduce a new antagonist in the form of Dr. Sophia Lamb, who is a psychiatrist and an altruist, kind of Ryan's opposite, was uh, the way that we wanted to sort of create a sort of polar philosophy in, in the setting. This is Dr. Sophia Lamb with a message for the people. Remember, you are not alone. So when Andrew Ryan founded uh, Rapture Under the Sea, he at first thought, the best and the brightest, and then he thought, as long as they think like me. At first, it was great. Um, you know, they had the elite were living at the bottom of the sea, free of all those constraints, and giving rise to miracle after miracle uh, of, of reason. Unfortunately, the cracks began to show. Uh, they, first of all, they needed some working class people to clean the toilets and to, uh, you know, scrub barnacles from the from the decks. Beyond that, he was so full of pride, so interested in bringing down the best of the best, that when a, a problem would emerge, such as, gosh, you've got people trapped in a leaky city under the sea and they can't leave, just signs of stress began to appear in, in his beloved uh, populace. And so Dr. Sophia Lam, a clinical psychiatrist, was in, invited down specifically to help quell these concerns they had about utopian life. And he hired her for her skill rather than her beliefs, which she, which she held very close to the chest. And only uh, when Lamb arrived did it become clear what she actually believed in. And she began to sort of spread these tendrils of, of thought, faith mostly, out into uh, the, the disenfranchised of Rapture. Daddy was sleeping for such a long time, and Eleanor has missed you. Find her and you'll be all better. I liked the idea of zooming in on a very personal story between a few people in, in Rapture for the sequel, and that the while the philosophical contrast would become the backdrop, the uh, sort of gross motives would come from a very gut level uh, sort of family conflict. That's how we came to the player's central motives. And so the player is this subject Delta, this, this uh, former Big Daddy who has now been, for some reason, awakened, has retained his free will, and is crossing the city to find his former little sister. Um, and so our, our Big Daddy definitely is a lot more human-like, and that's why he's sort of like the prototype Big Daddy and closer to a hulking, very powerful guy in a diving suit with still a lot more human qualities. Um, I think he's faster than a lot of people would expect from playing a Big Daddy and less clunky. The player comes into conflict with Sophia Lamb primarily because his former little sister uh, is, is sort of promising him escape from the city. And he's crossing the city to, to find her, but as he, as he begins to progress, um, he comes across some key details about her. For example, her surname. Uh, her, her, her surname is Lamb, and she is connected on, on a very personal level to, to uh, Dr. Sophia Lamb. Exactly how is one of the mysteries that you, that you sort of unravel as, as, you're, um, as you're making your way towards Fontaine Futuristics on the other side of the city. But Eleanor Lamb has a special role, and as the player uh, closes in on her, he begins to realize that she's being worshipped by the splicers and the sort of cult-like religion that has sprung up around Sophia Lamb. As he begins to pry Lamb's fingers loose from different parts of Rapture, he learns more about Eleanor's role in uh, the coming rebirth. The player begins uh, in the Adonis Luxury Resort, which is a kind of uh, Greek-themed uh, 
getaway where you, you'd go and, and have plasmid treatments and, and uh, atom-based rejuvenation therapy. It is, a, is now in, in a state of pretty advanced decay, but it was once the, 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 the place where the elite would gather. Uh, you begin to, to see little tiny hints of your personal story left there. Uh, one of the, the, the new things that, that we're talking about today is that Eleanor, your former little sister, will leave gifts for you, uh, things that, that sort of help you along your way and, and pull you towards her, uh, promising this freedom the, to see the sun. And uh, from the Adonis, the player, makes his way to the Atlantic Express train station. The, this is the central train hub that allows him to travel uh, rapidly across Rapture to find Eleanor Lamb. We had several different versions of the opening of the game where we tried to introduce plasmids and guns and hacking and we have you know, new quick melee uh, and a lot of change in different systems um, and finding a, a balance between packing in as much new stuff as we could early in the game versus overwhelming players. Uh, and then at a deeper level trying to find ways for the actual gameplay systems or sort of combat scenarios that you get into to complement the themes that are going on in the story as well. And we, we had the advantage of, of starting from Bioshock 1 and what was there, and that was a game that was a long process of arriving at the sort of RPG story-driven shooter hybrid. Uh, and I think it allowed us to focus on some of the fundamentals that weren't necessarily as strong in Bioshock 1, of just making uh, the, the control as smooth as possible, um, making the shooting as fun and as visceral as possible, bringing more sort of uh, life to the AI and a cover system. They can use cover and throw grenades and things like that. Um, and then there's a giant laundry list of pet peeves that different people have about the game. Um, and some people you know, hated the hacking system from Bioshock 1. Some people loved it and never wanted to see it go away. Um, and those are a lot more of a holy war within the teams. But you know, after a certain time, you come up with, with plans that you feel complement what you're trying to do with the game itself. And, and for us, a lot of the core sort of combat and gameplay, we kept coming back to fluidity and immediacy. The underwater segments, um, I mean, this really came from, from two places originally. One, it was just something that, that people really wanted out of Bioshock. It was something we heard about the first game a lot was, you know, wow, this city is really fascinating and amazing and I kind of want to see it from the outside. I want to see what it's like at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and then with us coming into it as you playing a big daddy, we had no excuse not to do it, basically. Um, and so. What it gave us is a, a really strong tool for, for gameplay pacing uh, because the underwater sections are sort of mysterious and beautiful and a lot more low key and uh, they give us a chance to sort of deliver a different kind of atmosphere um, because indoors in, in Bioshock is, is just always so tense. There's always something around the next corner. There's always a splice or there's always some danger. Um, and giving the, the players some, some downtime, a place where they actually know they're safe and can kind of soak up the beauty of the world and the wonder of their being this amazing city at the bottom of the ocean, um, gave us another really strong design tool to have that kind of enforced pacing of, of you know, player-driven combat and then a little bit of a downtime before you go on to the next thing. Your sister doesn't want you playing with me. There was a time where there was a single big sister in the, in the game, um, and she functioned very much as what we ended up with, which was a sort of boogeyman that guarded the, the whole atom economy and would come after you. And we needed to have something that could scare the crap out of you as a big daddy uh, when you were when you were playing the game, and that's really where a lot of the big sister came from. Um, and really, the the role playing that you kind of do as a big daddy, you can have your own little sister and gather from bodies and just you know beat the crap out of splicers and keep them away from you. We wanted to turn that on its head and give you an experience more similar to what a big daddy must have felt about Jack from Bio One, that there's this guy out there who just can hunt us down and kill us even though we're the most terrifying things in Rapture. Um, and the big sister really, really became that. And the, the idea is that uh, she is Lamb's agent over the whole atom ecology. And she's making sure that the atom is still flowing in the world, uh, which is important for other story reasons. It, it turned out really great because what you get out of it is, you know, you're running around as a big daddy, you've got all this power, you've got all these plasmids, all these weapons, um, and then all of a sudden you hear the scream off in the distance and you know the big sister is coming for you and that she's hunting you down and there's just a, a panic that strikes you and you sort of figure like, okay, where am I going to fight? Where's the best place to go? Should I go in there? Let me find a camera to hack somewhere. And you try to, very quickly, it turns the dynamic of the game where you're constantly, you know, on 
on the hunt against the AI. It turns the reverse of it and you're on the defensive again. Um, and this is a place where the, the iterative process of story and gameplay going back and forth um, fed back into Storyland and, and made the game stronger because of it. Uh, because what we discovered very quickly is if you have a single character that really the player knows they, they can't kill because they're so important to the story, um, you're completely removing all of the triumph of overcoming that, uh, that encounter with them. Um, and so the big sister uh, sort of spiderwebbed out into a system of, of multiple big sisters, and they are Lamb's agent, and they are um, guardians, again, as, as, as I've described before, uh, but we actually do allow you to, to kill them. There is still, that story uh, of the single big sister is still maintained in another character um, who you will learn more about as you play through the game. So it's, both of those concepts still exist, but we tweak them a little bit since our early conception of it to fit both the story and the gameplay uh, in a better way. On the topic of the people who have played Bioshock 1 and feel like uh, they, they've sort of been there and done that, those guys are the people who keep us up at night. We want to please them and we have uh, worked very, very hard across multiple studios to make sure that Rapture has fresh mysteries for them, that they're not going to be able to see uh, the surprises of the game coming. And hopefully that the improvements we've made to the game as a shooter, as, as just a, a pure system of, of, uh, of, of choices, bo both kind of mechanically and narratively, will give them that sense of familiarity when they come in, knowing what they know from Bioshock 1, but will deliver something that, that is able to blow them away. Uh, Bioshock 2 is coming out February 9th, 2010.